second honoree is somebody who thinks about that. She's a force to be reckoned with in the urban transportation field, internationally known as the former commissioner of New York City's Department of Transportation. She near single-handedly reshaped the face of New York with 400 miles of bike lanes, developing more than 60 plazas, including Times Square, launching seven bus service routes, and introducing City Bike to a now more accessible, more human-centric city. She's the chair of the National Association of City Transportation Officials and currently works at the Bloomberg Associates where she implements innovative urban design around the world. This Momentum Award winner is Janique Sadiq Khan. She won't be here, but I'll accept on her behalf and I know she would be thanking you. Absolutely, and we, have a, we do have a video from Jeanette. Hi, I'm Jeanette Sadekhan from Bloomberg Associates and former commissioner of the New York City Department of Transportation and author of Street Fight. And I'm honored to be an inaugural Momentum Award recipient and really appreciate the deep interest that Newsweek is taking in cities. When you think about it, cities aren't great because of their landmarks, their architecture, or their technology. In my work in New York City and in cities around the world, I've discovered that streets and street life are what makes cities great or not so great. But in too much of the world, city streets are dominated by cars. And this didn't happen by accident. This happened by design. For most of the last century, planners built cities for cars and pushed everyone else to the side of the curb. And today, we're still running cities on this old software because city streets don't come with update buttons. Mike Bloomberg was the closest thing we had to an update button. His Plan YC agenda in 2007 outlined a future for New York City that worked better for one million people in 2030 than it does today. And this meant looking at our assets differently. And one of our most important assets is our streets. In one of our first projects, we transformed a parking lot from a place that people went to park to a place that people wanted to be. We found new spaces hidden in plain sight, like here on Madison Square Park, where three busy streets collide and we created 65,000 square feet of new pedestrian space. And by working fast with temporary materials and starting with the change, instead of endless meetings, we could deliver projects in real time and at very low cost. But the biggest test of this approach was Times Square, which was a tangle of traffic. And so we piloted an idea to close Broadway from 42nd to 47th Street to cars and open it up to pedestrians. And from the moment we opened Broadway to people, it was filled day and night. There was a delay in getting some of the tables and chairs to the plazas, so we rushed out and bought low-cost beach chairs and put them out and gave pedestrians a new front seat to the crossroads of the world. If we'd gone through the usual construction process, we would still be talking about the idea of closing Broadway to cars instead of enjoying it today. And when we finished the work, pedestrian traffic shot up some 35%. Today, 480,000 people walk through Times Square every day, and it's become one of the top 10 retail locations on the planet, for good reason, because cars don't shop, people do. And this approach, moving quickly with temporary materials, doesn't take a lot of time and it doesn't take a lot of money. And this approach works as well in places like Addis Ababa in Ethiopia or in Mumbai in India, adding paint to create vibrant places that protect people. Fortaleza, Brazil, creating new canvases out of asphalt for the people of this city. And we've seen the power of this approach around the world transforming a parking lot in Bogota to a place that people want to be. To create a place for play and community in Milan, you can see the joy on the streets of that city. Cities are great when they give people transportation choices. And in New York City, that meant making biking a viable option. And we brought the first protected bike lanes in the United States to 8th Avenue and 9th Avenue, just moving the parked cars away from the curb and we created a new bike share system that's growing now to 40,000 bikes. And now you see bike share and protected lanes 
all across city streets. It's become the new gold standard for cities. I'm talking a lot about the hardware on our streets, but right now we are at a decision point about the software. If we can connect cars to the worldwide street, we have a chance to reduce the 40,000 traffic deaths that occur on American roads every year. But we need to keep our eye on the street. You know, if you Google AVs, you get hundreds of results of people chilling in cars. It seems that if you get driverless cars, you also get people in streets, except for this small kid uh, playing soccer on the side of the road. And if this seems familiar, it's because we've seen this movie before and we know how it turns out. This was the Technicolor fantasy in the 20th century. People cruising along in their cars, sipping coffee, watching TV and their Logans run turtlenecks. And this is the fantasy today, but with more of a kind of Xanax and vibe chill to it. But still with these blue turtlenecks, what's with the blue turtlenecks? But we have to be careful that we don't daydream while driving into the same dead end as the last century that we're just starting to drive out of now, because we know how that movie ends. You may know this picture. It shows how much space 60 people take up in cars, in a bus, or on bikes. And as you can see here, a car is still a car. It takes up the same footprint, whether it's an Uber or an autonomous vehicle. And the point isn't to make better cars, it's to make better cities. And we can't be so busy checking out the future of mobility that we turn our backs on the street design fundamentals that make cities great. I also chair the National Association of City Transportation Officials, which provides design guidance from the streets of New York and beyond to streets of every city. And this approach takes the traditional hierarchy that puts cars on top and people on the bottom and flips the script, putting people on top, putting people first and prioritizing active mobility and public transportation. The latest guidance is on autonomous urbanism and it looks at how we can ensure that the streets of tomorrow don't just keep pedestrians penned in at the side of the road. By providing a footprint and a blueprint to imagine them as places for everyone. And we don't need to wait for autonomous vehicles to revolutionize our streets. There's no reason we couldn't start today right here in Atlanta on Peachtree Street, turning it from a drive-through quarter to a place that people want to be. Because it's not a question of engineering. It's a question of imagination. And when you change the street, you change the world. Thank you so much for this honor. That was fantastic, wasn't it?